A Confession by Leo Tolstoy Chapter 1 I was baptised and brought up in the Orthodox Christian faith. I was instructed in it both as a child and throughout my boyhood and youth. But when, at the age of 18, I left university in my second year, I no longer believed in any of the things I had been taught. Judging from various memories, I had never believed very seriously, but had merely trusted in what I was taught and in what was professed by my elders. But this trust was very unstable. I remember when I was eleven years old, a high school boy named Volodya, now long since dead, came to see us one Sunday and announced the latest discovery made at school. The discovery was that there is no God, and that everything we were being taught was pure invention. This was in 1838. I remember my elder brothers taking a great interest in this news, and even allowing me to join in the discussion. We all, I remember, became very excited, and took the news as something very enthralling and entirely possible. I remember too that when my older brother, Dmitri, who was then at university, suddenly and with characteristic fervour embraced the faith and started to attend all the services, to observe the fasts and to lead a pure and moral life, we all, including the older ones, constantly made fun of him and for some reason, nicknamed him Noah. And I remember when Mushkin Pushkin, at the time a curator at the University of Kazan, invited us to a ball and jokingly persuaded my brother, who had declined the invitation, that even David danced before the ark. At the time I used to enjoy these jokes of my elders, and from them I drew the conclusion that it is necessary to learn the catechism, and it is necessary to go to church, but that one need not take it all too seriously. I also recall reading Voltaire when I was very young. I not only failed to be shocked by his humour, but even found it quite amusing. The decline of my faith occurred in the way in which it has always happened, and still happens, among those from our kind of background. It seems to me that in the majority of instances, it happens like this. People live as everyone lives, but on the basis of principles that not only have nothing in common with religious doctrines, but are on the whole contrary to them. Religious doctrine plays no part in life or in relations between people. Neither are we confronted with it in our personal lives. Religious doctrine is professed in some other realm, at a distance from life and independent of it. If we encounter it, it is only as an external phenomenon, disconnected from life. Now, just as then, it is impossible to judge from a person's life or behaviour whether or not he is a believer. If there is a difference between those who openly profess orthodoxy and those who deny it, then it is not the advantage of the former. Nowadays, as before, a public declaration and confession of orthodoxy is usually encountered among dull-witted, cruel and immoral people who tend to consider themselves very important. Whereas intelligence, honesty, straightforwardness, good-naturedness and morality are qualities usually found among people who claim to be non-believers. The catechism is taught in schools and the pupils are sent to church. Officials must be able to produce evidence of having received communion. But a person belonging to our circle who is no longer at school and has not entered into public service can still live for ten years or more without once remembering that he is living among Christians and is himself considered to be a practising member of the Orthodox Church. This was even more true 
in the past. Thus, today, just as in earlier times, religious teaching, which is accepted on trust and sustained by external pressure, gradually weakens under the influence of knowledge and experience of life that stands in opposition to the religious doctrines. A person can go on living for a long time, imagining that the body of religious instruction imparted to him when he was a child is still there, whereas it has in fact disappeared without leaving a trace. An intelligent and honest man by the name of S told me the story of how he lost his faith. At the age of 26, while resting overnight on a hunting expedition, he followed an old childhood custom of kneeling down to pray in the evening. His elder brother, who was with him on the expedition, lay on some straw watching him. When S had finished and was preparing to lie down, his brother said to him, Do you still do that? Nothing more was said between them, but from that day on, S stopped saying his prayers and going to church. And for thirty years he has not prayed, has not received communion and has not gone to church. And this is not because he knew his brother's convictions and wanted to share them, nor was it because he had resolved something in his heart, but simply because this comment of his brother's was like a finger being pushed against a wall that was on the verge of collapsing from its own weight. These words indicated that the place where he had thought faith to be had long been empty, and that the words he spoke, the signs of the cross and genuflections he made in prayer, were essentially meaningless actions. Having recognised their meaninglessness, he could no longer continue doing them. Thus it has happened, and still happens, I believe, with the great majority of people. I am speaking about people from our type of background, of people who are sincere with themselves, and not of those who use the profession of faith as a means of obtaining some kind of worldly aims. These people are the most fundamental non-believers, for if faith is seen by them as a means of achieving various worldly aims, then it is certainly no longer faith. People of our upbringing find themselves in a situation where the light of knowledge and of life have melted away an artificial edifice, and they have either failed to notice this and swept it away completely, or have simply failed to notice it as yet. The religious instruction communicated to me since childhood faded, as it does with others, only with the difference that since I had begun to read and think a great deal while still very young, my abdication of religious faith occurred very early. When I was sixteen I ceased saying my prayers, going to church or fasting of my own accord. I no longer believed in what I had been taught as a child, but I did believe in something, without being able to say what it was. I believed in God, or rather I did not deny God, but what kind of God I could not have said. Neither did I reject Christ or his teachings, but what I understood by the teachings again I could not have said. Now, looking back at that time, I can clearly see that the only real faith I had, apart from the animal instincts motivating my life, was a belief in perfection. But what this perfection consisted of, and what its aim was, were unclear to me. I tried to perfect myself intellectually and studied everything I came upon in life. I tried to perfect my will, setting myself rules I tried to follow. I perfected myself physically, practicing all kinds of exercises in order to develop my strength and dexterity. And I cultivated endurance and patience by undergoing all kinds of hardship. All this I regarded as perfection. The beginning of it all was, of course, moral perfection. 
but this was soon replaced by a belief in general perfection. That is, a desire to be better not in my own eyes, or before God, but in the eyes of other people. And very soon this determination to be better than others became a wish to be more powerful than others, more famous, more important, wealthier. Chapter 2 Some day I will relate the story of my life, and of how touching and instructive were those ten years of my youth. I think a great many people must have experienced something similar. I longed with all my soul to be good, but I was young. I had passions and I was alone, completely alone in my search for goodness. Every time I tried to display my innermost desires, a wish to be morally good, I met with contempt and scorn. And as soon as I gave in to those base desires, I was praised and encouraged. Ambition, lust for power, self-interest, lechery, pride, anger, revenge, were all respected qualities. As I yielded to these passions, I became like my elders, and I felt that they were pleased with me. A dear old aunt of mine, the purest of creatures, with whom I lived, was always saying that she wished for nothing as much as that I would have a relationship with a married woman. Rien ne forme un jeune homme comme une liaison avec une femme comme il faut. Another happiness she wished for me was that I should become an adjutant, and preferably to the emperor. And the greatest happiness of all would be for me to marry a very rich girl and acquire as many serfs as possible through the marriage. I cannot recall those years without horror, loathing and heartache. I killed people in war, summoned others to duels in order to kill them, gambled at cards. I devoured the fruits of the peasants' labour and punished them. I fornicated and practised deceit, lying, thieving, promiscuity of all kinds, drunkenness, violence, murder. There was not a crime I did not commit. And yet I was praised for it all, and my contemporaries considered and still consider me a relatively moral man. For ten years I lived in this fashion. During this time I began to write out of vanity, self-interest and pride. In my writings I did the same as I did in life. In order to achieve the fame and money for which I wrote, I had to conceal what was good in myself and display what was bad. And this is what I did. Time and again I would contrive in my writings to conceal, under the guise of indifference or even light-heartedness, those strivings for goodness which lent meaning to my life. And I succeeded and was praised. After the war, by which time I was twenty-six, I returned to St. Petersburg and took up company with writers. They accepted me as one of them, and flattered me. I had no time to stop and look around, before I had assimilated the view of life held by the group of writers with whom I mixed, and before long, all my earlier attempts at improvement had been erased. Their outlook provided a theory that justified my undisciplined life. The view of life adopted by these people, my literary associates, was that, generally speaking, life is a process of development in the course of which the most important role is played by us, the thinkers, and that among the thinkers it is we, the artists and poets, who have the most influence. Our vocation is to educate people. In order to avoid being confronted by the most obvious question, what do I know and what have I got to teach? Their theory explained that it is not necessary to know this, and that the poet and the artist teach unconsciously. I was considered a superb artist and poet, and it was therefore quite natural for me to adopt this theory. I, an artist and poet, 
wrote without knowing myself what it was I was teaching, and I was paid money for doing this. I was provided with excellent food, lodgings, women, company, and I was famous. It must then be the case that what I was teaching was very good. This faith in the meaning of poetry and in the evolution of life was a religion, and I was one of its priests. It was very profitable and pleasant to be one of its priests, and for a considerable length of time I lived in this faith without ever doubting its validity. But in the second, and still more in the third year of this existence, I began to doubt its infallibility, and to examine it. The first point of doubt was that I had begun to notice how the priests of this religion disagreed among themselves. Some said we are the finest and most useful teachers, and it is we who teach what is needed, while the other teach falsely. And others said, no, we are the real teachers and you teach falsely. They argued, quarrelled, deceived and tricked one another. Moreover, there were many among us who were unconcerned as to who was right and who was wrong, but who simply achieved their own selfish ends by means of this activity of ours. All this forced me to doubt the truth of the faith. Furthermore, once I had begun to doubt the truth of this writer's religion, I started observing its priests more closely, and became convinced that almost all priests of this faith, the writers, were immoral men, the majority of bad and worthless character, and much inferior to the people I had met during my former dissipated military life but they were complacent and self-satisfied in a way that is only possible for people who are truly holy or for those who do not know what holiness is. These people became repugnant to me and I became repugnant to myself and realised that the religion was a fraud. But strange to say, even though the utter falsehood of this creed was something I came quickly to understand and to reject, I did not discard the rank these people bestowed on me, that of artist, poet and teacher. I naively imagined that I was a poet and an artist and could teach everybody without myself knowing what I was teaching. And this is what I did. Through my association with these men, I acquired a new vice, an unhealthily developed pride and an insane conviction that it was my vocation to teach people without knowing what I was teaching. Now, when I think about this period and about my state of mind, and that of those around me, and incidentally there are thousands of them nowadays, I feel sad, terrible, ridiculous. It arouses in me precisely the same feelings as one might experience in a madhouse. At the time, we were all convinced that we must talk and talk and write and publish as quickly as possible, and as much as possible, and that this was all necessary for the good of mankind. And thousands of us, contradicting and abusing one another, published and wrote with the aim of teaching others. Failing to notice that we knew nothing, that we did not know the answer to the most basic questions of life, what is good and what is evil. We all spoke at the same time, never listening to one another. At times, we indulged and praised each other, in order to be indulged and praised in return. At other times, we grew angry and shrieked at each other, just as if we were in a madhouse. Thousands of workers toiled day and night, assembling millions and millions of words, which were distributed by post over the whole of Russia, And we taught and taught, but never managed to impart all that we had to teach, and were always annoyed that we were given so little attention. Horribly strange, but I now understand it all. Our genuine, sincere concern was over how to gain as much money and fame as possible. 
and the only thing we knew how to do in order to achieve this aim was to write books and journals. This is what we did. But in order for us to pursue this utterly useless task and to have the assurance that we were very important people, we needed an argument that would justify what we were doing. And so we devised the following. Everything that exists is rational and all that exists evolves. And it evolves through enlightenment. Enlightenment is measured through the distribution of books and journals. We are paid and respected for writing these books and papers, so we must be the most important and useful people. This theory would have been all very well had we been in agreement, but since any thought expressed by any one of us was always contradicted by the diametrically opposed views of another, we should have been forced to rethink. But we did not notice this. We were paid money, and those who sided with us praised us. Consequently, every one of us believed himself to be in the right. It is now clear to me that there was no difference between our behaviour and that of people in a madhouse. But at the time, I only dimly suspected this, and like all madmen, I thought everyone was mad, except myself. Chapter 3 And so I lived, abandoning myself to this madness for another six years until I married. During this period I went abroad. Life in Europe and the contact I had with advanced and learned Europeans still further reinforced the belief in overall perfection by which I lived, for I found the same belief among them. With my own self, this belief assumed the form it usually takes among the educated men of our time. The belief was expressed in the word progress. At the time, I felt that this word had some meaning. Living as I was then, like any individual, I was tormented by the problem of how to live a better life. I did not yet understand that in answering live in conformity with progress. I was speaking exactly like a person who is in a boat, being carried along by wind and waves, and who, when asked the most important and vital question, where should I steer, avoids answering by saying, we are being carried somewhere. At the time I noticed none of this, only occasionally led by more instinct than reason. I rebelled against the superstition so prevalent in our age, by which people shield themselves from their failure to understand life. Thus, during my stay in Paris, the sight of an execution revealed to me the precariousness of my superstition in progress. When I saw the heads being separated from the bodies and heard them thump, one after the next, into the box, I understood, and not just with my intellect, but with my whole being, that no theories of the rationality of existence and progress could justify this crime. I realised that even if every single person since the day of creation had, according to whatever theory, found this necessary, I knew that it was unnecessary and wrong. And therefore, that judgments on what is good and necessary must not be based on what other people say and do, or on progress, but on the instincts of my own soul. Another instance in which I felt that the superstition of progress was inadequate in regard to life was the death of my brother. He was an intelligent, kind-hearted, serious man who became ill when he was young suffered for over a year, and died in torment, without having understood why he had lived, and still less why he was dying. No theories could provide the answers to these questions, either for him or for me. During his slow and tortuous death. But these were only rare instances of doubt, 
and in truth I continue to live, professing faith only in progress. Everything is evolving and I am evolving, and the reason why I am evolving together with all the rest will one day be known to me. This is how I would have formulated my belief at the time. When I returned from abroad, I settled in the country and busied myself with the running of the peasant schools. This occupation was close to my heart, because in it was none of the falsehood that had become so apparent to me and struck me so forcibly when I was a literary teacher. Here too I was acting in the name of progress, but I had already assumed a critical attitude towards this progress. I told myself that in some of its manifestations, progress had proceeded incorrectly, and that here, when dealing with the primitive peasant children, it was necessary to act in a spirit of freedom, leaving them to choose whatever path to progress they wished to take. In reality, I was still confronted with the same insoluble problem of how to teach without knowing what I was teaching. In the higher circles of literary activity, it was apparent to me that I could not teach without knowing what it was I taught, for I saw that everyone taught differently, and that in our arguments we only concealed our own lack of knowledge from each other. But here with the peasant children, I thought I could avoid this difficulty by allowing the children to study whatever they liked, it amused me to recall how I sidetracked in order to fulfil my ambition of teaching, while knowing very well in the depths of my heart that I could not possibly teach what was needed, because I did not know what it was. After a year spent occupied with the affairs of the school, I went abroad again in order to discover how to teach others what I did not know myself. I thought I learnt this there, and equipped with all this wisdom I returned to Russia in the year of the emancipation of the serfs. I took up the position of arbitrator and started teaching the uneducated people in the schools as well as the educated people through the journal I had begun publishing. This seemed to be going well, but I felt that my mental state was not altogether healthy and that this could not continue for long. I might perhaps have fallen at this time into the same despair that I fell into when I was fifty if there had not been one aspect of life I had not yet experienced and which promised salvation. This was family life. For a year I involved myself with arbitration work, with the schools and the journal, and soon exhausted myself. This was largely due to my confusion. The struggle as arbitrator became so burdensome, my school activities so complex and my journalistic prevarication so repulsive to me, since they always consisted of the same thing, the desire to teach everyone while concealing the fact that I did not know what I was teaching. I became ill, spiritually more than physically. I threw in everything and left for the steps of the Bashkirs to breathe fresh air, drink kumis, and live a primitive life. On my return I married. The new circumstances of happy family life completely distracted me from any search for the overall meaning of life. At the time my whole life was bound up with my family, my wife and my children, and thus in concerns for improving our means of living. My striving for self-perfection, which had already been replaced by a striving for perfection in general, that is, for progress, was now sublimated beneath the straightforward desire of achieving the best for my family and myself. Thus another fifteen years passed. Despite the fact that during those fifteen years I considered the writer's task unimportant, I continued to write I had already tasted the temptations of authorship, the temptations of enormous financial gain and applause for my trivial work, and I devoted myself to it as a means of improving my material position 
and of stifling any questions in my soul regarding the meaning of my own life or of life in general. I wrote, teaching what was for me the only truth, that we must live in order to give ourselves and our families the best possible life. And so I lived, until five years ago, when something very strange started happening to me. At first, I began experiencing moments of bewilderment. My life would come to a standstill, as if I did not know how to live or what to do. And I felt lost and fell into despair. But they passed and I continued to live as before. Then these moments of bewilderment started to recur more frequently, always taking the same form. On these occasions, when life came to a standstill, the same questions always arose. Why? What comes next? At first, I thought the questions pointless and irrelevant. I felt the answers were well known, and that should I wish to resolve them, it would not cost me much effort. That for the time being, I did not have time to work it all out, but that when I put my mind to it, I would find all the answers. However, the questions repeated themselves over and over again, demanding answers with more and more urgency. They felt like full stops, always on the same spot, uniting in one large black spot. And then, what happens to everyone stricken with a fatal inner disease happened to me. At first, minor signs of indisposition appear, which the sick person ignores. Then these symptoms appear more and more frequently, merging into one interrupted period of suffering. The suffering increases, and before the sick man realises what is happening, he discovers that the thing he had taken for an indisposition is in fact the thing that is more important to him than anything in the world. It is death. This is just what happened to me. I realised that it was not just a casual indisposition, but something very serious, and that if the same questions kept repeating themselves, they would have to be answered. And I tried to answer them. The questions seemed so stupid, simple and childish, but the moment I touched upon them and tried to resolve them, I was immediately convinced, firstly, that they were not childish and stupid questions, but were the most important and profound questions in life, and secondly, that however much I thought about them, I could not resolve them. Before occupying myself with my Samara estate, with the education of my son or with the writing of books, I had to know why I was doing these things. While I did not know why, I could not do anything. Amidst my thoughts concerning the farm, which at the time kept me very busy, a question would suddenly come into my head. Well, fine, so you will have 6,000 desiatins in the Samara province and 300 horses. And then what? And feeling completely taken aback, I would not know what to think next. Or, beginning to reflect on the education of my children, I would ask myself, Why? Or, deliberating on how the peasants might achieve prosperity, I would suddenly ask myself, What concern is it of mine? Or, thinking about the fame my own writing brought me, I would say to myself, Well, fine, so you will be more famous than Gogol, Pushkin, Shakespeare, Molière, more famous than all the writers in the world. And so what? And I had absolutely no answer. Chapter 4 My life came to a standstill. I could breathe, eat, drink and sleep. And I could not help breathing, eating, drinking and sleeping. But there was no life in me, because I had no desires whose gratification I would have deemed it reasonable to fulfil. If I wanted something, I knew in advance that whether or not I satisfied my desire, nothing would come of it. If a magician had come and offered to grant my wishes, I would not have known what to say. 
if in my intoxicated moments I still had the habit of desire, rather than real desire. In my sober moments I knew that it was a delusion and that I wanted nothing. I did not even wish to know the truth, because I had guessed what it was. The truth was that life is meaningless. It was as if I had carried on living and walking until I reached a precipice from which I could see clearly that there was nothing ahead of me other than destruction. But it was impossible to stop and impossible to turn back or close my eyes in order not to see that there was nothing ahead other than deception of life and of happiness and the reality of suffering and death, of complete annihilation. Life had grown hateful to me, and some insuperable force was leading me to seek deliverance from it by whatever means. I could not say that I wanted to kill myself. The force beckoning me away from life was a more powerful, complete and overall desire. It was a force similar to my striving after life, only it was going in the other direction. I fought as hard as I could against life, The thought of suicide now came to me as naturally as thoughts of improving my life had previously come to me. This idea was so attractive to me that I had to use cunning against myself in order to avoid carrying it out too hastily. I did not want to rush, simply because I wanted to make every effort to unravel the matter. I told myself that if I could not unravel the matter now, I still had time to do so. And it was at this time that I, a fortunate man, removed a rope from my room where I undressed every night alone, lest I hang myself from the beam between the cupboards. And I gave up taking a rifle with me on hunting trips, so as not to be tempted to end my life in such an all-too-easy fashion. I myself did not know what I wanted. I was afraid of life, and strove against it, yet I still hoped for something from it. All this was happening to me at a time when I was surrounded on all sides by what is considered complete happiness. I was not yet fifty. I had a kind, loving and beloved wife, lovely children, and a large estate that was growing and expanding with no effort on my part. I was respected by relatives and friends far more than ever before. I was praised by strangers and could consider myself a celebrity without deceiving myself. Moreover, I was not unhealthy in mind or body, but on the contrary, enjoyed a strength of mind and body such as I had already witnessed in my contemporaries. Physically, I could keep up with the peasants tilling the fields. Mentally, I could work for eight or ten hours at a stretch without suffering any ill effects from the effort. And in these circumstances, I found myself at the point where I could no longer go on living. And since I feared death, I had to deceive myself in order to refrain from suicide. This spiritual condition presented itself to me in the following manner. My life is some kind of stupid and evil joke that someone is playing on me. Despite the fact that I did not acknowledge any such someone who might have created me, This concept of there being someone playing a stupid and evil joke on me by bringing me into the world came to me as the most natural way of expressing my condition. I could not help feeling that out there somewhere somebody was amusing himself by looking at me and the way I had lived for thirty or forty years, studying, developing, maturing in mind and body, and how now, with a fully matured intellect, having reached the precipice from which life reveals itself. I stood there like an utter fool, believing so firmly that there is nothing in life, that there never has been, nor ever will be. And he laughs. But whether or not this someone laughing at me really existed did not make it any easier for me. I could not attribute any rational meaning to a single act, let alone to my whole life. I simply felt astonished that I had failed to realise this from the beginning. It had all been common knowledge for such a long time. Today or tomorrow, sickness and death will come, 
when they had already arrived, to those dear to me and to myself, and nothing will remain other than the stench and the worms. Sooner or later my deeds, whatever they may have been, will be forgotten and will no longer exist. What is all the fuss about, then? How can a person carry on living and fail to perceive this? That is what is so astonishing. It is only possible to go on living while you are intoxicated with life. Once sober, it is impossible not to see that it is all a mere trick and a stupid trick. That is exactly what it is. There is nothing either witty or amusing. It is only cruel and stupid. There is an old eastern fable about a traveller who is taken unawares on the steps by a ferocious wild animal. In order to escape the beast, the traveller hides in an empty well, but at the bottom of the well he sees a dragon with its jaws open, ready to devour him. The poor fellow does not dare to climb out, because he is afraid of being eaten by the rapacious beast. Neither does he dare drop to the bottom of the well for fear of being eaten by the dragon. So he seizes hold of a branch of a bush that is growing in the crevices of the well and clings on to it. His arms grow weak, and he knows that he will soon have to resign himself to the death that awaits him on either side. Yet he still clings on, and while he is holding on to the branch, he looks around and sees that two mice one black and one white, are steadily working their way round the bush he is hanging from, gnawing away at it. Sooner or later they will eat through it, and the branch will snap, and he will fall into the jaws of the dragon. The traveller sees this, and knows that he will inevitably perish. But while he is still hanging there, he sees some drops of honey on the leaves of the bush stretches out his tongue and licks them. In the same way, I am clinging to the tree of life, knowing full well that the dragon of death inevitably awaits me, ready to tear me to pieces, and I cannot understand how I have fallen into this torment. And I try licking the honey that once consoled me, but it no longer gives me pleasure. The white mouse and the black mouse, day and night, are gnawing at the branch from which I am hanging. I can see the dragon clearly, and the honey no longer tastes sweet. I can see only one thing, the inescapable dragon and the mice, and I cannot tear my eyes away from them. And this is no fable, but the truth. T the truth that is irrefutable and intelligible to everyone. The Delusion of the Joys of Life that had formerly stifled my fear of the dragon, no longer deceived me. No matter how many times I am told, you cannot understand the meaning of life, do not think about it, but live. I cannot do so, because I have already done it for too long. Now I cannot help seeing each day and night chasing me and leading me to my death. This is all I can see, because it is the only truth. All the rest is a lie. Those two drops of honey, which more than all else had diverted my eyes from the cruel truth, my love for my family and for my writing, which I called art, are no longer found sweet. The family, I said to myself. But my family, my wife and children are also human beings. They are in exactly the same position as I am. They too must either live a lie or face the terrible truth. What do they live for? Why do I love them and look after them, bring them up and watch over them, in order to reach the same state of despair that fills me, or in order to be dull-witted? If I love them, I cannot conceal the truth from them. Each step taken in knowledge leads them to this truth, and the truth is death. Art, poetry, for a long time, under the influence of success and praise from others, I persuaded myself that this was a thing that could be done, despite the fact of approaching death which obliterates everything, myself, my works, and the memory of both. 
but I quickly realised that this too was a delusion. It was clear to me that art is an adornment and embellishment of life, but it had lost its charm for me, so how could I charm others? While I was not living my own life, but was being carried along on the crest of another life, as long as I believed that life had meaning, even if I could not express it, the reflection of life in poetry and in art of all kinds gave me joy, and I enjoyed watching life through the mirror of art. But when I began to search for the meaning of life, when I began to feel the necessity of living, I found this mirror either unnecessary, superfluous and ridiculous, or tormenting. I could no longer be comforted by what I saw in the mirror, namely my stupid and desperate position. It was all right for me to rejoice in the sight, while in the depths of my soul I believed that my life had meaning. Then the play of light and shade, the comic, the tragic, the touching, the beautiful, and the frightening aspects of life comforted me. But when I saw that life is meaningless and terrible, the play in the mirror could no longer amuse me. However sweet the honey, it could not be sweet to me while I saw the dragon and the mice gnawing at my support. But that was not all. Had I simply understood that life has no meaning, I might have accepted it peacefully, knowing that it was my lot. But I could not be calmed by this. If I had been like a man in a wood from which he knows there is no way out, I might have been able to live. But I was like a man in a wood who is lost, and, terrified by this, rushes around, hoping to find his way out, knowing that with each step he is getting more lost, and yet unable to stop rushing about. It was all quite dreadful. And so, in order to escape from this horror, I wanted to kill myself. I felt a horror of what lay ahead of me, and knew that this horror was worse than my present position. But I could neither drive it away nor patiently await the end. However convincing the argument that said a blood vessel of the heart would collapse anyway, or that something would burst and it would all be over, I could not wait for the end with composure. The horror of the darkness was too great, and I wanted to escape from it as quickly as possible by means of a rope or a bullet.